What's up, everybody? This is Brandon Barnes, host of the ReSimply podcast, uh, where we're here to make real estate simple. So I have a good friend of mine, awesome investor out of New York, but also living in another country while doing investing. Brett Iwanowitz. How you doing, buddy? Oh, what's up, Brandon? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing great. I'm excited. Yeah, when when we talked about launching the Resimply podcast, I was like, I told everybody in our meetings, first guest has got to be Brett. Period. Love it. Love the, it. Every time I sit with you in a mastermind, like you're in Resimply, you're using it. It's it's such a big part of your business, and I, I think you know what a great person to tell your story. Thanks, man. You're gonna make me blush. <laughs> there you go. Well, you need you know a tan from Guatemala. So, <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Where do you live? Where are you at now? What kind of investing are you doing? Yeah, so I'm uh, primarily wholesaling. Um, last year I did it, you know, a dozen, not a dozen, close to a dozen flips. Um, but this year we're just dialing it back into strictly focusing on wholesaling, probably 95% of our deals. Uh, maybe some novations, maybe one or two flips here and there. I reside in upstate New York, so my market is in Rochester. Uh, pretty small market, pretty stable, which is great. And time flies, but I moved to, uh, I live in Antigua, Guatemala as well. So I'm here six to seven months out of the year and uh, do everything remotely. Um, I'm here right now from Guatemala. And so I've been here like a year, a year and a half. That's uh, dude, I, I remember you kind of talking about it. You and I are in a similar, or in the same mastermind. And I remember you saying, um, you were gearing up for the move. Yeah. And it was, you know, practicing, doing stress testing your business. And it's crazy. It's been a year and a half now since you've, you've made, had the ability to do that. Dude, it's wild, man. And I had only been operating, I say a legitimate business. We had a legitimate business model, probably a year and a half. So it was still in infancy stages. I just got comfortable going belly belly in the living room with sellers. And then I completely changed it to going remote from another country pretty quickly. So a, a huge learning curve. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So, so tell us a little bit, how did you get into real estate? how did you find investing wholesaling? You know, you just came out of the womb wholesaling, right? Uh, out of the womb wholesaling. Gosh, I mean, where do I start? Um, I, I guess I was created with some type of entrepreneurial spirit. Like I always, I never felt, I never felt like I would ever work for somebody, you know, I was an average student, you know, got my graduated from a local private college with a human resource degree. Um, during that time, I got to do some networking, got involved in some local RIAs, got to meet a few people, but I was really at that time, man, I was, I just couldn't connect with people. Like I was super shy, um, very difficult to have conversations with other people, very disconnected kind of just from relationships with people. It's kind of weird because I'm completely different right now, but I made, I made some connections and I, I kind of got involved in someone's business who started a student housing company and that kind of got me involved in uh rentals property management we did some construction not major construction and that was kind of like my my uh, stepping stone to learn a little bit more about real estate but it really was a long journey after that relationship ended where i you know dabbled here and there bought some properties did some more flips to where i, I really it wasn't until i had hired a coach that kind of really helped me focus my energy like i knew i could be successful but it, i did really needed someone to just dial that energy and doing the right things so you started working with or helping out with somebody else you were doing flips kind of like one-off stuff on the side or finding stuff or yeah, you know, you were talking earlier, like I, you know, I, so I basically helped manage or start a student housing company, rented it by the room. So I did that for seven years. The guys, if you're looking to get a, in a business relationship, make sure you have your own attorney and get contracts so you don't get bent over and screwed when, when people don't want you working for them anymore, because that's essentially what happens. So I spent seven years didn't you know i learned i learned a little bit but i was expecting to be mentored through to help me learn how to do this on my own and that definitely wasn't the case so after that i started a prop, my own property management company you know i did some house hacking i you know flipped a couple properties a year bought a few rentals here and there um, and did that for like six to seven years and literally you know at that point after that six or seven years i was just spinning my wheels yeah trying to live off rentals trying to run a management company trying to flip properties you know, I would do anything to make some money. So, I, you know, I did GC contracts for people and it seemed to be like I was working my ass off and literally getting getting nowhere. And it was a really frustrating time in my life, to be honest. So you were just, it was just like, hey, you were thinking very short-sighted since I got to pay this bill, let me make some money. 
let me do anything you can. Cause didn't you say once you're like painting or how? Like yeah, yeah, I had a, so that's kind of how I made some money at a painting company. So I had a, I, I, yeah, I was painting full time. I had a one worker for me. We did, we made pretty good money. Um, but a lot of that went to paying my employee cause I'd have to work 10 other jobs. So I'd go start the shift and leave at 11 and go work five other jobs for the day and then just rinse, wash and repeat that um, every day, which I hated. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny you say that. So I was just at the dentist before this and the lady asked me what I did and I told her, she's like, do you, do you renovate for regular people? Like, and I was like, there have been times that I have and I've learned that the money's not worth it. It's, no. I, I, no. I stick to what I do, what I do well. If you want to trade here, I'll hand you somebody that I would recommend handing you, but other, outside of that, you manage it yourself. Yeah, Which, yeah, I don't want any part of that. I mean, you can give me ten thousand dollars to manage a project. That would take a month. I won't even take it. Yeah, it's it's amazing <laughs> once you start kind of honing in your energy in the right places. Yep. You don't have to chase these small checks here and there. Um, yeah. Bigger checks. Yeah, it was like I mean, essentially, it's it's just survival mode, right? Like, I think the one thing I learned from Steve, and I don't know if you remember this, one of the things that he shared with us in one of our master, Ascend Masterminds, he said, "Learn how to make money, learn how to keep money, then learn how to invest money." So I, part of what I, the mistake that I made, I was trying to learn how to buy rentals and live off of rentals and I wasn't even making consistent money. And so it just was not, I mean, I probably could have sustained through it. I probably would have hated myself even more, but yeah. it just, it, you know, I wasn't making consistent money and you're basically is just winging it, which I think I, a lot of people tend to do the same thing. There's no real vision or plan behind what they're doing. It's just following, like I was, we were talking about before, we're kind of, kind of following like what's cool or what other people are doing, which in the end uh, takes a lot of people down the wrong path. And usually they just walk away from real estate. Yeah, it's two things on that. So I do remember when Steve told you that you first you gotta learn how to make it, then you learn how to keep it, and then you learn how to invest it. And I was like, yep. this is such a simple thing. It blew my mind. And then, I, and then Maggie and I sat down afterwards, just like, we have to figure out first how to consistently make the money. Yep. Now that we're making it, now how do we keep it? So we we went from making money to investing money and then went through what we went through because we didn't keep any of it. Yeah. And I last year, you know, I had a six figure tax bill and I'm like, okay. How do I not pay another six figure yeah. tax bill? That was the most one of the most painful things I've ever had to do, you know, because when you like if I feel like Keeping money is almost a little bit more difficult than learning how to make it. That might sound crazy, but you know, how do you, so you're making multiple six figures. How do you not pay that back? Like, where does it go? I mean, if you, if you have a family, you know, are you setting retirement funds up, school funds? I mean, that money goes so quickly. Yeah. And then how do you invest it? You know, if you're putting it all these other places too. So it's just, it, it takes a lot of education and that's why it's so great to kind of have these discussions or even be on podcasts or have the masterminds to really get a, you know grasp on how to build wealth yeah it's it's because it's not what you see on tv instagram and what everybody else is doing yeah and one of the reasons that I, we I found the mastermind that we're in is a good friend of mine when i was looking for a coach i said i'm looking to hire somebody to coach me whether it be a mastermind or a private coach whatever it is and this piece of advice has always stuck with me he said, hire somebody that has the life that you want to live. Yeah, man. So there's the Gary Vaynerchuk's out there. I love Gary. I love his message. I follow him, but I don't want to be Gary. Yeah. I don't want to wake up and say, hey, I'm just going to outwork you 90 hours a week, seven days a week, all year. And shoot me. Was, yeah, no, it, to me, I'd rather make less money and go coach soccer, which I'm going to go do after this podcast. Awesome. It. And it's it's really understanding like what what's important to you is it because there's plenty of people hey wear the badge of hard work make a ton of money live that life that's what they want i respect it i appreciate it we need them in the world and then we need the people like you in the world who are like hey this is my vision i don't care if people think about it it's badass so tell people what that was for you and kind of how you went down the path of, of what you're doing now with your lifestyle the first mastermind and coaching i got involved with was through life and Air. i got the opportunity to be in uh, steve steve cook which was the founder of life and Air. 
And um, I worked with Steve, I think like three or four years in that. And and I don't even think we discussed anything real estate related. It was all, I don't even know what to call it. It was a lot of mindset work, um, changing how I think, how I act, really dialing what I, what I want for my life. And that's why I also resonate with Steve Cavanaugh because like he has, you know, the hashtag LLOV, living life on vacation. So Brandon brought up a good point is like, if you're looking for a coach, forget about how much money people are make, making, like try to find out what their lives look like. And if they don't, if they're not going to give you a clear picture, then I'd probably run from that person because they're probably miserable and hate their lives. Um, but life and air got me started to understanding, like building a vision. We did a three day getaway, which, which is a, a vision building course. And that's when I got invited to be in Steve, um, cooks, um, flip ups because I just gave it my all basically like laid my shit down on the table and was like, help me. <laughs> somebody <laughs> so i uh, participated all out in that event and then i basically dialed in like okay i want to make you know i'd love to make you know six figures it, it wasn't even multiple it was just six it was just six figures have flexibility have time and um and also i'm somewhat conservative now but like what would I, like if i lost everything like how long could i survive for like what kind of business and lifestyle could offer me the fact that if i just stop doing what i'm doing you know i'll still be okay and so that was a lot of that played into debt management and looking at debt and paying off debt restructuring my life and my vision and that's essentially how i got um or how i moved toward wholesaling because wholesaling offers you the flexibility i hate managing construction projects um and so what could give me flexibility to work remotely um and make good money in real estate and it was and i decided it was wholesaling so did you when you when first off playing all out in anything is key to massive success yeah going into a room whether it be a big time mastermind a small group whatever it is lay your shit on the table just as you said the more vulnerable you are the more real you are the more people see it and the more people want to help you yeah so the first most important thing you did, I've done the life and air thing. It is, it's amazing. Was moving to Guatemala like in that original vision or was it just, hey, I just want flexibility and this is what I'm gonna build. Where where did where did moving to another country part-time come in? It dude, it was never even in. It was it was kind of like a like a curveball. So the way I had been operating was I didn't know where I would going or what I'd be doing, but it was just like, okay, I want something flexible or if I want to start traveling more, like I have the ability to do that. And so um, it started with, it was kind of cool, like going back to the finance aspect of it. What, what's the fastest way you can make more money? I'm, I'm asking you. Fastest way I can make more money? Yeah. Selling. What's that, wholesaling? You mean in real estate or just in general? Just in general. It's sales. Well, yeah, that's a great answer, but it's just pay off, pay off your debt. Like oh, yeah. increasing cash flow. So like, Correct. so instead of trying to look for the fastest way to make money, it's like, what, what is the fastest way I can increase my cash flow? And so instead of, so I just started hammering my debt down with any money that I was making, I started reducing my debt, getting all my debt under control. So once that debt was under control, then I could hundred percent focus on my next step was, which is like, which was building, which was building a, a wholesaling business. Um, but it, it, Guatemala came into play when I, cause I started mm -hmm. coming on mission trips here with Steve Cook. And uh, the school that we help with and still help with, my girlfriend's uh, on the board right now, um, is called La Escuela Integrada. And so we would come out here and participate in, in, in mission trips and help work with the school. And so um, I really enjoyed it. I really loved Antigua. In fact, I had mentioned to my now friend Hannah, like I could see myself spending a lot more time here. And I think it was less than three years later, you know, I moved, I moved here. So it was, she's the matchmaker. So it was for a girl, everybody. So I, she, Hannah introduced me to uh, an amazing woman. Her name's Lihia. Um, very smart. She's got her master's in finance and we hit it off. And um, I convinced a friend to take a vacation here. And then I told him when we got here, I'd be meeting this girl and he didn't. He wasn't too happy because it was supposed to be a bro's vacation, but it all turned out. And um, I made the move here pretty quickly after that, which was a, a whole nother kind of crazy adventure in itself. So you third wheeled the guy to another country. I did. Hey. I did, man. I did. But you know, <laughs> if, if it doesn't turn out well with the girl, then you're like, hey, I don't want to be here by myself. So I get, I, I get it. And if there you go. There you go, you man. You'll understand it. Yeah, so we talked for like uh, six or seven months before I came out here, and so meeting her was like, um, it was it was like we had already known each other, and we we hit it off really well, and uh, 
just to, you know, we can keep talking about Ascend, but it, if it wasn't for Josh Bacon in Ascend, um, this is why I so great guys to like, uh, to invest in yourself. Um, you know, information's free, but like you already have all the information you need to be successful. You probably just need some more accountability. So find people to hold you accountable. Cause in a good mastermind, someone's going to tell you you're full of shit or you're not full of shit. And if you're not full of shit, they're going to help you put a plan together and take action. And if you are, they'll be like, Hey, you're in the wrong group. Get out of here. Yeah. I hate to say it so bluntly, but that's the mastermind and accountability. I think people need to be looking for, but I had called a friend and say, Hey, I think I was a year into my business. And I said, Hey Josh, like I'm considering moving to another country. I think I'm doing, I think I'm on the right track. Can you come into my business and look at my numbers? I didn't know, I didn't know how to manage KPIs. I didn't even know much about KPIs and wholesaling. I was making money. I was doing deals consistently, but I needed like a real model or real numbers to model my business after. And we spent four months working together, creating a plan. So we meet every Friday, create a plan. And I moved in less than six months. Um, I literally changed my whole business in less than six months and left the country. That is, I, that's incredible. I didn't realize it was that fast. I knew he yeah. was helping me. Cause it'd be funny, the mastermind, you know, he'd be like, I already know your numbers, Brett. What, what are your numbers? <laughs> Dude, it, it was less, it was about four and a half months where I moved, where I started working with him and then just literally moved out of, out of Rochester. So learning your numbers, were you using Resimply yet? Or were you just using like a standard CRM? So, or Josh and I started with his KPI spreadsheet to just give me to build a foundation. And so um, basically I just needed like, cause this is another thing too. Like if you're starting a wholesaling business, there needs to be, or any business, you need like some type of metrics, like a foundation for what success looks like. It has to be, it has to align with some type of data. So like, where do you get that from? Um, you get it from other businesses, right? Yep. Or other businesses who you want to create the same type of business model. Josh and I's businesses, business are almost identical in terms of what we want our numbers to look like. So, you know, he set the tone and set, and set the metrics of like how many calls I need to make, how many appointments we need to go on to get the conversions. It really helped me understand the data and understand the conversion ratios to know like what I need to what I need to be doing every day to reach the the, the finance goals there. So it was, it was pretty cool. and. Free simply is great. Um, you know, growing a business is definitely difficult. So I think I'm about 90% of the way there um, of managing all our KPIs directly in Resimply instead of using um, outside spreadsheets. Yeah, when we did our sales call last month, I mean that I'm I'm leading next week, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You the numbers that you were able to just kind of bring out quickly and accurately is a testament to tracking it and then also having a system that helps you track that. I mean, you know numbers that a lot of people never understand their business. And that's really important for you, especially being virtual. Like you have to be yeah. able to look at something, trust it and say, what I'm doing in Guatemala, in New York is working. Let me just trust these numbers and continue to do it. Dude, that's, man, you just gave me the goosebumps because the same goes for having a sales process. Like that's why I paid for John Martinez training. I, I, I hated sales. I hated talking to people. I hated numbers. I hated marketing. I hated everything that I'm doing now. I had absolutely zero confidence doing people. So if I can do it, you, I'm not even joking. I, I wasn't good at math. I hated numbers, hated data. All that stuff was overwhelming. I lacked zero confidence. Um, you know, I, I didn't even communicate very well with my my friends and my family like i rejection was you know everyone fears rejection but that's all you're doing every day talking to people is being rejected and so i invested in that the rei sales academy man that training changed my friggin' life man the best investments i ever made so because I, I remember talking to you in miami and you, you said that you're like i practiced really hard repetition just constantly yep. it's impressive what you've built and so now as a as a soon to be as you would consider fully built business owner do you make decisions based on your metrics now versus emotion like are you have you gotten better at that yeah it's um in fact some people might think i lack emotion because it is this business should be all data driven because you know how you know you go into a home and you like man i really like this home i'm just gonna buy it i'm gonna try it out and how does it end up working out you're like nope shit, i should never have bought that i should have paid less so like you know, being able to make decisions with a foundation for the decision-making process, we'll call it the decision-making funnel, is, is definitely gotten me to where I am today. 
um just following that sales process like hey i know this sucks i know i hate it but like i know it's worked for all these other people let me just follow it and the same thing for the kpis like i hate doing this but i know the numbers and i know if i do this and i'll see results and you just have to be consistent you know it's not easy it's just consistency over long periods of time it's not like business isn't sexy man you you'll hit some grand slams every now and then and get some really good deals but you just if you can hit singles and doubles for five to ten years man you will be in really good shape build a boring business cody sanchez <laughs> i think i think that's that's her she she like her favorite thing to do is buy boring businesses it, in it they they can they're predictable they're repeatable which yep. is what you're going to learn the more years of data you have, you know, because if you replace yourself in sales or whatever it is, you're going to have standards. Hey, this is what 21 looked like. This is what 22 looked like. This is what 23 looked yep. like. So now let me build 24 based on these numbers. Yep. Yeah. I, it's, it's well, I, you were part of that call. So now I have two full years of data. And now I'm kind of nerding out. I'm like, ah, oh, this is like super cool because I can plan. So, the way that my numbers look now, um, I do all of our acquisitions. And so I'm failing horribly at that role because our business is growing. So if you guys are curious what my team looks like, I have uh, uh, two full-time VAs, a part-time VA, um, but I do everything. I do our data polls, I do our marketing. Like I literally, I'm our lead acquisition manager. And so I probably spend less than 10 hours a week talking to sellers, I'm not even joking. And you know, we did, uh, I think it was like close to 400 or just over 400, 400, 500,000 last year, which was 38 deals, um, which for me is great. Like I never expected to ever make that kind of money. Um, but I have a million dollar business without a doubt. Yeah. So I had a chance to review one of my competitors uh, numbers from last year. And not only is my business probably, I don't know, 10 X is like, we're super lean. My business is incredibly lean and, um, we reviewed their numbers. And if I, I have the chance to bring on someone, um, to my team, we could do over a million with my business right now. So we're averaging about three, there's like 3.3 deals a month. And my numbers with a full-time acquisition manager, I know we can do over a million, which is incredible, but I wouldn't be able to project that unless I were to look at my, my, my last two years numbers and then compare those KPIs with other businesses. So that's been instrumental in like understanding and where I've came from, what I can do and in, in potentially setting up of, of future goals. So it's been awesome. And so is that kind of what you're working on this year is, is bringing on a team, bringing on something else to help you kind of get out of the role of the sales calls? Is that what you're trying to, or all of it? Like what's uh, what striving towards now that you have all this? Yeah. I was thinking about it today. If I, I don't know if I would be happy if I dropped taking calls with sellers, although I've been, you know, passing off, uh, we're kind of an experimental, experimental stage. I've been passing off leads, um, to someone and we can get into that home so much faster. There's so much less qualification for me to just to have someone go belly to belly in the living room. Um, so that process is so much smoother. It's cleaner. We can get more appointments, get more offers, get more contracts. It's a lot, it's very difficult negotiating. I'll have people hang up on the phone with an offer. Then I'll call my competitor and be like, Hey man, let's JV this deal. And they'll go, go in and get it at the price that I made the offer on and they're hanging up on me. And so those are, a lot, I, I have to pay more. And if I'm partnering with someone that we, I love, I mean, I probably partnered on over a quarter million dollars with someone that I had to split last year. So imagine if that was all in house, yeah. um, there's a lot more money coming in, but I, 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 I think I might maintain par a partial role in the acquisition. I just had to hire an executive assistant. So, um, to take over all my admin, um, and then my goal was to stay in the acquisition manager role, which if I can get my EA dialed in, I'll probably only have to work three to four hours a day. Um, and we should be able to do close to half a million dollars just working three to four hours, which is really cool. And that three to four hours is talking to sellers. Talking to sellers, yep. So in your business, you would consider you talking to sellers one of the highest ROI things that you can do currently. Yeah, and I'm failing miserably at doing it right now is because that's, that's the problem with growing a business. So I hire and train everybody in house. And so all the updates, you know, resimply launch control, um, trying different marketing channels. I have to, you know, split test marketing, learn new marketing channels, re-educate myself with updates, train my team, manage my team, create scorecards for my team, audit my team. And so that has taken a lot of my time away from, um, 
talking to sellers, which which is a good problem to have because I already have a plan to get that time back. But it would be even better if I could bring on a full time acquisitions manager just to see like can i really do over a million because i know we can that's cool that's super yeah, cool man. And, and what you just said there for new people building a business especially the solopreneur type people when you're doing tasks that are not out of your like doing and good at if you do the quadrants the amount of energy it sucks from you is unbelievable and what happens is you'll train and build all this stuff and then when it comes to the hour of phone calls you need to make or whatever your metric is you either don't have good phone calls or you don't do it bro i i probably man i had a couple so it was the last month it was either end of january or early february where i had three sellers we went and saw their properties i didn't even call them back and make offers because i was like i'm like no I'm burnt. I'm burnt. So it's, yeah, you're right. If I wish I was introduced to the ex executive assistant role sooner, I did not think there were people out there who could just basically take, I mean, there's, they're, they're doing a hundred different things and they love it. And it's like, yeah. why would anyone ever want this job? Yeah. And so, yeah, it was really cool to be introduced to even what that is. Like I had never heard of an executive assistant until what, maybe six or eight months ago. And like what their job role is, is basically to take your clutter and organize it for you. And I'm like, it's a huge investment if it's a full-time role 60 grand a year um but that's a couple deals you know that's maybe three deals and if i'm not getting those three deals to pay for that person then there's something wrong with me and so yeah so that's been huge and there's probably four months or five months more of onboarding her that I, that's gonna still steal my time but when she's in there you know it's gonna it's gonna be really really exciting so i'm i'm pumped about it and that's key there you're even though she's in there and she's working you still have four or five six months of training like continuing to grow it because you, know, you think ea you think some guy at the top of a skyscraper some lady answering his desk you're like oh i, I can't have one of those and yeah. then you realize there are people out there who just love dealing with your chaos and yeah. organizing it and and solving your problems because and a lot of it has to do with they understand what you're trying to grow like hey if yeah. i can remove this from this person then they can grow and it can benefit everybody yeah yeah they love i think it's cool because they love to see it's i don't want to say it's instant growth but the the amount of like it would it almost would almost look like instant growth that they get to be a part of just by giving these tasks like my business should you know probably scale pretty quickly just getting that time back with the amount of appointments contracts and offers um, then actually my EA, someone died in their family and she didn't work on Monday and she didn't do any of her reports. Um, and typically I'd be the type of person that would just go in and do it myself. And so I said, you know what? I hired someone to do this. They'll do it later this week. And I focused on talking to sellers and this Monday was one of the best Mondays I've had in a long time. So awesome. that's awesome. Yeah, man. So to turn into resimply a little bit, let's talk about resimply. Let's talk about what you're using it for and, and some things that are having success. What all are you using inside of the platform and how long have you used it? So I think like two and a half years, I've been using very simply, man, I, I think I use everything in there. Literally, I just started using and understanding list stacking this past year. Okay. Um, I just got rid of uh, MailChimp and ClickSend. So ClickSend I would use to, to talk to buyers, MailChimp I would do our marketing for, for our buyers deal. So I, I just brought that back in house. Um, we'll be using the dialer um, for on the list stacking feature, but the biggest, so if I were to choose one thing that has helped scale my business, it's the ability to communicate effectively with sellers, create tasks and to create follow-ups. And, you know, understanding in this business that like a no is only a no if it's like a F you, like I'll kill you, yeah, I'll come to your house and kill you, Just please stop calling me, that's a no for us. And so. You can set up those follow-up campaigns. We saw some people already simply posting deals 500 days. I mean, we've closed deals 500 days, 700 days. And so that has really allowed us to kind of remain consistent as far as marketing goes, because marketing is somewhat seasonal. And so those follow-up deals trickle in and really help keep the business moving forward. So yeah, we're, we're managing our KPIs. We run our team meeting reports out of there. You know, we have our daily huddle. We run out of there, like filters are great. The tags are great. Being able to manage those leads with your teams and have your teams communicate effectively in there has been instrumental to our growth too. And I can keep going on and on. You want me to pinpoint like one thing specific? <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think you nailed. I think you nailed it. Though. I think the ability to follow up, create flow with them. I've always looked at a as a 
CRM, you know, I've heard plenty of people say just use an Excel sheet if you're starting, which is perfectly fine. There's plenty of people who build businesses off having Excel sheets and dates and following up. But how I've always tried to think about a CRM is like as another employee, mm -hmm. you know, can it send some text messages for me? Can it follow yeah. up? Can it remind me just like an, an executive assistant. Yeah. They may not make the phone call, but they may send you a message. Hey, Brett, you have to call this person back at three o'clock today. And if your program that's running your business can do all those things for you, in turn, it should also add some deals to your company. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've got, that's a really good point. I'm, I'm hope some other people listening who, who kind of considers that like re simply is, is basic. It, it almost acts like another employee for it because you can only talk to so many people you can only do so many things. And so if you have this system following up for you, um, doing RVM text drops, I mean, we've got, a, I mean, sometimes it just takes a, Hey, how you doing text, follow up texts on our drip campaign to get people active again. And it, it can really be something is that simple. And, and then being able to track those and see it and create different, different follow-ups for different lead statuses, um, has been really great creating more aggressive follow-ups, warm follow-ups. So yeah, man, I'm, I'm with you. I think, I think what, we simply really helped me do is understand how to be an effective marketer. And I think one of the reasons why is because like, I probably have 40 phone numbers, which might sound crazy, but like I can track, you know, Liz Pendon's direct mail, probate direct mail individually, um, to see how they perform and split test those. So, yeah. you know, our SEO PPC. Um, so that's been really cool. You wouldn't be able to do, I and mean, if you could do that in a spreadsheet, you're like, light years above i think probably you and i where you can build out some type of model but yeah i mean you you basically can go to your dashboard and just compare all your marketing which will save you thousands and thousands of dollars to make sure that if something's not performing you have to change it right and you have to make that adjustment and that's what that system allows you to do sharad when him and i talked about it you know that was something he has always pressed about it it's like not only can i tell you if direct mail is working or SMS is working or whatever's working, I can tell you which list, you know, which yep. set of contacts specifically. And depending on your market, you know, Rochester is a small market where I live's not as small, but still small in a sense of like how much data is available. There are people in bigger markets that don't maybe pull all the data. And if they have a list that's doing really well, they should get all of it they can get. They should get their hands on every data set for that list that they can possibly come across. Yeah. Yeah, man. I think, yeah, I, I love that. I just, I just did a, my first, I don't do direct mail. So we do PPC SEO. Um, like I want to be like the number one, uh, business online for, for home buyers. And we're pretty close. We're ranking top three and it should be probably top two consistently, um, with the people we're working with. That's cool. But, but, um, yeah, just gosh, I kind of lost my train of train of thought here with where I was going with this. Um, Bring me, bring me back here, Brandon. Down in like the list specific. Oh, yeah, list. So being list specific, like when we get calls back, like we can scroll down and see like what list that came from, which is huge because then we can track our. So we do a lot of filters weekly and monthly to see where our data is coming from. And yeah, you can say, hey, this list is performing this great in August. So you can start tracking those things by month and start pulling more and more of that data to market when you start seeing the spikes. So it, yeah, it, it, if you're good, if you spend time in your business understanding those things and understanding those lists, um, it can really be a big difference in, in being a good business to being a great business. You know, just like list stacking, you mentioned it. I remember when I first got into real estate, list stacking didn't exist. I remember people talking about this mystical thing of list stacking and the amount of data was wasted on mail because you couldn't split duplicates out. You couldn't see whether you were mailing people multiple times because i'm sure at one point or you may still have it a million excel you know csv files scattered throughout your desk bro i i used to have to i had someone else who would manage that stuff all for me i'm like i don't know and then thankfully like when we kind of parted our ways like i got introduced to list stacking resimply i mean it wasn't in resimply at the time but things started to become easier with data management and now i think anyone can can understand and manipulate data to be effective with it which like you know five years ago i don't think really was was a was a thing so that's been huge too to to our growth yeah i, I remember or the company 
but literally that's all they built was a list stacking service that was it was the first one of its kind where you could take all of your sheets put it into this this software and then all of a sudden be like oh i have twenty thousand records thirty thousand records people are duplicates i have one guy that owns 30 properties let me not mail him 30 pieces of mail or send him 30 text messages i dude i can share with you how valuable that is so my my main competitor we i got to look at some data and their marketing spend is more than quadruple of what i spend but we generated similar amount of leads wow that's how i know how my business could perform because they did over a million they won't four four mil um with the same amount of leads and our, our conversions are very similar and so but that's what this software can do is if you're and i don't know what's happening outside of where that money is going but like you have to manage your data effectively otherwise you waste it and i think i think for us and man just going back to josh bacon most people fail at this or don't do really well at this because they keep wanting to buy new data like I've been hammering, like you have to buy new data every now and then, but I've been hammering the same data over and over again. Just follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up. And when I'm, when it slows down, I'll buy, buy new data, but like you need a system where you can track all of those things. So you're just not wasting money. And yep. you know, that's a good testament to having good systems. So you're not spending all this money and not seeing results you want, but that's how you go broke too in a, in a business is you just keep spending, spending, spending. And you don't manage what you have already really well, and you just go broke. You know, sp imagine having a big sales team, and they, all they want is new leads, new leads, new leads, new leads, and you want to make them happy. And you're seeing contracts, you're seeing revenue, you're seeing things coming in, and you realize there's all these leads that they're just not working hard anymore, that are just dying on the vine. And there's there's money in that stuff. I know Bacon when he looked at my business, he's like, dude, you you have like six weeks worth of stuff here that you just need to just he's like don't, yeah, man. don't download a new list don't skip trace anything he's like this is it i don't want to hear about anything new until you just hammer this stuff away and he could see it because he could see all the data that i had he yep. could see everything that came from it and it was like you're right i don't i don't need anything new i don't need this new marketing piece that somebody's selling me a subscription on i just need to work what you got it's here to work yeah you got to call through those leads until they tell you to f off man that's that's the best way to manage that data and do it until until you get that response we just had another mastermind out here in guatemala the master mission and we we had someone similarly who was who was struggling to see results dude as soon as he went home and started calling people he got a deal a week later i bet you i knew that is who is it is it keith no it wasn't keith but it was okay. someone, that, someone that keith knows yeah <laughs> got it okay got it all right so um i appreciate that so we're gonna wrap come towards the end here um, unless there's anything else you want to share about resimply your story i think i think we've i mean i could talk to you guys all night but i'm sure you don't want to listen to me talk all night uh, unfortunately i have kids soccer which See? um i mean it's i don't know that as much soccer it's more kind of herding cats and yeah but it's it's a blast uh um, but so I have four kind of rapid fire do it. questions um, pertaining to the pillars that we built Resimply on, which is data, marketing, sales, and operations. And basically if, if you were, let's say starting or, or trying to make your business more consistently, what would be the one thing you would do with these four items? And so the first one would be data. Is there a list? Is there something you pull? What's one thing you would give advice about data to somebody Man, yeah, I, so when I got started, I really spent some time educating myself and talking to other business owners about, about creating lists that have multiple stressors for sellers. So like they'll have multiple reasons to, to want to sell. And so I think that's a great place to start. If you're looking at data, you want to go to the, the people who, you know, might be in pre foreclosure or might have uh, tax liens or whatever it is. So you're, you're stacking multiple stressors on top of the seller, but there's one list that I really like that might seem weird. It's in, it's, a, it's a, and I had a different name for it, but it's like an owner occupied investor, which might sound crazy. So this is a person who owns two or less properties. So this is someone who becomes an investor by chance. Okay. Family inherited a home. They move out of state or owned a home here. They move out of state, have friends move in the property or start running the home out. So I do really well with that list. It's, you can filter it out by someone who owns uh, 
uh, two or less properties or three or less properties with like 50% equity. That's been a kind of a fun, a fun list. Um, and, and one of those came from Ryan Dossey. Um, I don't do well. I think all, every markets are a little bit different. I don't do well with landlords or retired landlords. I've hammered those lists and haven't gotten anywhere. Um, I know my demographics like 50 and older single families, um, you, you know, so I've kind of dialed in my age and demographic and um it's kind of just starting pulling data on that so it just it does take some testing but to get started you want to try to call people if you have a limited budget who are going to be you, you wouldn't just pull like a high equity list right because yeah. you might have to call a ton of people to find someone motivated you've got to start calling the motivated sellers first and the more stress factors they have the more motivated they should be and if yep. you have limited time or funds or resources obviously a good place to start and exactly. I, like that, I like that list, like accidental landlord list and probably a filter that you could put, I don't know if you use this or not, but you could make it to where they own it in their own name and not an LLC. Yep, it is. Sorry. Yeah, so it's it's and actually one filter is individual and it's still owner occupied. So the two or less, I still check individual and owner occupied, but they don't live here, which there's no way to really filter that out. So that's, yeah, definitely. Gotcha. All right, and then so for marketing, what would be one thing on marketing advice you give? I feel like everyone hates cold calling. I feel it's like a rite of passage, you know, like if you can't figure out how to talk to somebody, then you should probably not do this. So if you wanna excel rapidly at being successful in real estate, cold calling is the way to go. But the the next, you know, texting is, is relatively inexpensive. So using a text platform, you can reach a lot more people in a shorter period of time. It does cost a little bit more money. Um, as far as those platforms are go. So um, yeah, we did, we started, I started off cold calling and when my time was maxed out, we moved over to texting to reach a lot more people a lot quicker. Awesome. And so from an operational standpoint, you know, you being fairly solopreneur, what's something you would give people advice on setting up the operations of the business? Uh, know your, I don't know, like know your strengths and weaknesses, I guess, because if you can dial that in, I think, so someone, I think it was Jeff, Jeff and our last mastermind told us to like write every, everything we do every day. And I can't remember exactly how he said it. You're either putting check marks or writing what you like or you don't like, or basically you're trying to figure out everything that makes you happy with what you do daily. And so start tracking those things because at some point you have to unload those on somebody else or you're not going to be successful. So for me, like I wanted to learn acquisitions and be really, really good at that and dial that in. And so the first person I hired, um, was someone to take over i was the cold caller and then i we stopped cold calling and we started texting so i brought in an in-house uh um girl to do my texting she's been with me three years now um and so she handles that full time um so just like you have to start if you want to scale or you want to focus on something you just have to figure out what that looks like for you as a person and as a business and some people don't want to build out teams but you like you can only do so much right if you have a wife if you have kids so you're gonna have to hire you have to learn how to be a good leader and a selfless leader and lead by example and so that's a whole nother challenge yeah. that's a long-winded answer but that's a whole if you can't learn how to be a gracious leader um if you're going to be a dictator you probably won't be too successful or if you are it'll be short-winded but you just have to learn how to lead people well i think awesome and then last thing is sales from the sales ninja himself what's one advice or tip you'd give about sales to either a newer person or somebody kind of in the process of building. so what i would have done differently um i probably would have found like a large operation and try to get a sales job and learn sales either partnering with someone like working dead leads from a from a other wholesaling business the poor i think that's a that one if that that if that question was first as far as sales goes i would probably try to go work for other wholesaling businesses or flipping businesses and learn that model from somebody else I think that's a great way to, to, to be successful and then go off on your own. But like, you have to learn it from somebody. So you have to learn a process. I paid for it. It was $10,000. If you don't have the money, you can learn that for free by giving someone else your time. Like maybe you don't have a lot of time. Maybe you want to learn sales. So you cold call for somebody for free and then you JV those deals. So you can always learn that um, in a number of different ways. Find someone you like or a business that you want to get to know more or be around. That's a great way to, to find mentors too. Awesome. Yeah. Know your resources, know what you have. Do you have yep. time? Or do you have money? And I think, I think you're spot on. Like if you have time and no money, go get a sales job. 
I will tell you, when I hired my first coach, I put nine grand on a credit card and paid 900 a month for like two years and I couldn't really afford it. <laughs> but um, I'm only bringing that up because um, like, I think we talked about briefly, like what's the one investment you can make in yourself? It's like, you know, if you, that's something you have to consider too. I think Ryan Pineda was even talking about this the other day. I invested in myself before my business. Um, and I think that was, that, that was instrumental of where I am today. That's awesome, dude. Brett, I had an amazing time catching up with you. Thanks, um, I'll see you in a few months, uh, face to face, hopefully. Yeah, man. And I think I'm supposed. To, I think there's something on my calendar to come to Guatemala. I might have to look that we discuss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we've got plenty of space. Steve will be here in a couple weeks, so he's bringing the family down. So you are more than welcome to awesome. come down and enjoy this amazing weather here in Guatemala. Cool. Well, tell people how they can find you, connect with you, um, share Instagram, email, whatever you want to share. Yeah. I mean, my, my handle on uh, Instagram is at uh, flip number four freedom. Um, so you can find me on there. I, I, I don't spend too much time on, on Instagram, uh, that much, but I can get back to you in a couple of days. That's what happens. I don't know. Another thing is like, you just get focused, man. The highest and best use of time is definitely not on being on social media. Yep. So if you want to spend time on social media, build a business first and then spend time on social media. But uh, yeah, Flip for Freedom. Um, my business is Brett Buys Rock Houses. I don't know if you can see it here. So you can find me through my website and give us a call um, or, or email me, Brett at Brett Buys, uh, I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you. Thank you.